Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Rachel Wojtek, and we are continuing our march through the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Roman are we Republic. to that point? Re- the Republic? The Republic. The Republic. We, so we we've, we've, we've not empire. reached the empire. No, we're about to. But we've passed the... The the founding of Rome. <laughs> We've gone from kingdom, kingdom to republic to republic to oligarchy, still pretending to be a republic uh-huh. to a um, the beginnings of an empire pretending to be an oligarchy pretending to be a republic. Oh, that's pretty layered. Uh, yeah. I don't know if I can track with this. <laughs> All right. Um, so we left off last time with Pompey and Crassus. Uh, they were they forced the Senate to make them consuls. How did they uh-huh. do that? Should well, I ask? Well, they had just put down uh, Spartacus's slave revolt. Uh, they had crucified how many slaves was it along like six thousand? Six thousand, yeah, along the Appian Way from Capua to Rome. So, and they had an army. It's it's funny how senators will change their mind and their policies when a general with an army is nearby, especially when that general has just been very successful and is loved by the people for being successful. So force is, you know, not so much putting a a sword to the throat as it is saying, you know who we are, you know what we've done, you know know our army. Let's talk about the political realities here. (laughs) Here's what we want. Yes, sir. Whatever you say, sir. We, we we couldn't do this without you, sir. Uh, and and so from here on out, these two men begin to wheel and deal. Pompey gets the job of suppressing piracy through the Mediterranean, which he does quite admirably, as it turns out. He also pursues uh, battles in uh, Asia Minor, uh, Turkey, and uh, on into Syria, which is north of Israel, and then down toward Palestine. Along the way, he finds he founds 39 cities. So you got a guy here who is a brilliant, successful general. He puts down slaves. He builds cities. He conquers our enemies. He makes the world safe from pirates. What a guy. <clears throat> it's, it's about this point in, in Israel, which was a thing now, uh, the Maccabean revolt having been successful. Two of the brothers from the Hasmonean family, have a quarrel over who should be the next priest king. And rather than let everything descend into total civil war, someone has the bright idea of, I know, let's ask General Pompey. He's next door conquering people. You know, they got what they deserved on this one. (laughs) (laughs) So Pompey agrees to come in and uh, sort things out and decide who should have lawful succession. And he looks to the weaker brother and says, well, it's obviously you. (laughs) <laughs> He's a weaker brother, an easy prey. The other brother runs off and tries to stage a coup and a comeback, and that doesn't work. And so eventually, what Judea, Israel, falls under uh, control of Rome as a client state, which is why when we open the New Testament, suddenly this guy named Caesar Augustus is on the throne and Rome's every place. Uh, the Jewish state just sort of gave up its freedom by asking the beast to come in and and solve the problems. Settle its disputes. Yeah. While this is um, going on, there is one man we should mention in passing simply because of his legal and philosophical importance. Literary importance is something else. I'm not qualified to speak about Roman literature. And the man is Cicero. He is considered by those who know such things, the greatest orator of all time, certainly the greatest orator of the Roman age. He not only recorded his own orations, but he wrote books on how to speak good and all that stuff. <laughs> um, but he was um, he was fiercely loyal to the Republic and, and managed to uh, uncover conspiracies against, the, say, the most famous, the, the conspiracy of Catiline, who under the pretense of abolishing debts, which in itself was not really a great thing to be pretending or doing, he was he was trying to overthrow the existing government, put his own in place, and Cicero was ever to, was able to expose him. So, you know, for the moment, Cicero's writing high, he's this great orator, he's the son of the Republic, he's 
uh, our, he's our hero in our hour of need, and he does, he doesn't even want to rule or do anything. In passing, <clears throat> though, in his, amongst his many uh, orations, he writes he writes a great deal about law because in those days, orators were generally lawyers. I mean, why do you learn to speak good so that speak well so that you can um, convince government agencies or senates or whatever to do the thing you want them to do? This is this is where uh, Socrates got his start, and the and the sophist in Greece. It continues to be a thing. With uh, Augustine, Augustine becomes a lawyer and an orator. He becomes an orator, so he can be a lawyer, so he can convince people to governments to do things. Um, and along the way, he writes a treaties, a number of them actually, but this from one. He says, true law is right reason in agreement with nature. Uh, therefore, it's of universal application, unchanging and everlasting. True, let me say that again. True law is right reason in agreement with nature. So man applies his disciplined reason, his rationality governed by the laws of logic, to the natural world as it appears to him. And out of that, he deduces the moral law that should govern people, states, nations, whatever, uh, there is no divine revelation here. The gods do not speak. There are no oracles from beyond. There is man facing the universe with his reason, and from it deducing a law that is universal. Now, the Stoics had already wondered over this way, and we'll talk about them probably next time. But this idea that there is a law inherent in nature that reason can find, we have words for this. It's called natural law theory. And Cicero was key in honing it and fashioning it and passing it on and making it look pretty cool. The state, then, he writes, is the incarnation of reason and, and of law, and it ought to be the chief end of all men. Did you hear that phrase, chief end of man? Hmm. Hmm. It ought to be the chief end of all men to make the interest of each individual and of the whole body politic identical. So we so each harmonize should... the one and the many. Exactly, you got mm -hmm. it. Yeah, that's that's exactly what he's saying. <laughs> um, not by force, but by a, a rational perception of the way the universe actually works. The universe is designed to be that. If only we could see it, and just if we keep disciplining our minds to think it through uh, in the light of what we see in the natural order. We'll come up with this universal law that will bind everyone and everyone will be happy. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> it's anyway. so funny because like, yeah, the world does work that way where you have to try <laughs> to figure out how to balance the one and the many. There's a reason the universe <laughs> works this way. <laughs> well, you know, and I'm sure you believe there was a reason it worked that way. It just had nothing to do with the triune God. Yeah. Now, Cicero did encounter, and one can't follow, he finally finds someone who admits to, knowing Jewish friends, uh, knowing the Torah, having read it, and having rejected it. You know, like, oh, that's fascinating. That gives me an idea or two. But uh, overall, no, that's no. Transcendent God, nah, creation, out, no. No, we're going my way. Well, you're a nice guy, but that's a little too much, isn't it? So he's in the background while Can I add one more thing about oh, Cicero? Yes, absolutely. A uh, little fun fact that the uh, first published work of John Calvin was oh, yes. a commentary on Cicero uh, mm. after he had finished, or I think he was either finishing or had finished law school. Mm -hmm. uh, so he also was connecting with this, but it was as that was being published, we don't know exactly when that John Calvin was converted. And so the <laughs> next thing he wrote after commenting on Cicero was his first version of the Institutes. They follow, I think, three or four years apart. So it's it's interesting to wow. see uh, before his conversion, this was what appealed to John Calvin. And mm. then after you see him move to a very rigorous and uh, well thought out uh, explanation of the faith instead. You know, and his, his epistemology shifts, shifts radically. Uh, open the first chapter of the Institutes and start mm -hmm. reading. But when he does get to the Doctrine of State, he's a little vague -ish. You can still see a few echoes. <laughs> um, but some, some of them are almost ironic when, when Calvin argues that the state should invoke, enforce both tables of the Mosaic Law. 
how many um, Calvinists want to do that today? <laughs> a part of his argument is even the pagans know that you should enforce laws that defend the sanctity of the gods. Are we more profane than they are? <laughs> you know, that's kind of a good argument, but kind of not. It just depends mm -hmm. on how, how serious you are and what you meant by that. Uh, yeah. he does, what, what does enforcement mean? <laughs> well, in, with civil punishments, um, mm -hmm. Calvin's... Um, commentaries on Deuteronomy, it's, um, some of his more mature thought does lean toward a more theocratic approach to civil government. Or, but the, the institutes are still kind of vague uh, in the area of, well, there's this common law of nations, and he goes from there. Um, so it was something, Calvin had more pressing concerns. Europe yeah. already, <laughs> Europe already um, was the child of, of the hybridization of Roman law and Christian law under Justinian. Uh, and and so it wasn't like, well, today in America, where we have no concept of right and wrong, Europe pretty much shared a concept that, and it was easy to say, oh, this is the common law of nations. Every nation I go to believes this. Yes, because they were been all Western Christian you know, nations. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and thus Calvin had better things mm -hmm. to do than worry about the fine points of, of law and such. Uh, but his uh, his introduction to foundations, to epistemology, to how do we know, how do we know that we know are incredible. And that he should go from trusting Cicero about such things to trusting God as the starting point of all things is a testimony to God's incredible grace in the man. So that's Cicero, for those of you who have, <laughs> who have never met him. Um, Taylor Caldwell wrote, she was a Roman Catholic author back in the, I believe, 50s and 60s. She wrote a number of semi-religious um they're barely historical novels, but novels set in the context of more or less historical characters. Uh, I believe her book on Cicero was called Pillar of Iron, but she want, wrote one about Luke, Dear and Glory's Physician, and some others she would recognize if I could come up with them right now. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're interested in Cicero, that might be a way to go. More probably pick up a book written by Cicero and start reading, and you get more <laughs> useful information. While this is going on, a young man from a um, well-off, somewhat powerful, but not supremely powerful household, pushes himself forward. His short name is Gaius Julius Caesar. There was, they, they all had more names, you know. Um, he's, he's young, he's brash, he's bold, he's intelligent, he's charismatic, he's unclear about his sexual preferences. Um, he can write well, and uh, he manages to worm his way into the ground on which Crassus and Pompey stand. Word about Crassus. Crassus is rich, uh, richest man in Rome, I believe is his title. He's not well-respected. He's not charismatic, <laughs> and no one likes him a whole lot. And, and so really early on, the, the, goal, the, guy, uh, yeah, the idea here is that, yeah, Pompey's going to clean up the seas and, and go being the great general he is. Uh, they have some plans for, for Julius Caesar. Crassus says, I know what I need to do. I need to go to the far corners of the empire, those nasty Parthians over there in the northeast who are constantly at our heels and on our borders. And I'm going to go there and I'm going to be, I'm going to make my name as a great general. Because I know I can do that. That doesn't go well at all. And we'll come back to that. But um, so that's going on. Caesar has a, a sort of similar perspective on things. He knows he he doesn't have it. He, he has all the things I said, but he doesn't have much of a reputation. He doesn't have much personal wealth, and he doesn't have an army. Uh, he does not have a track record of winning wars. So, and he's younger than the other two. So he agrees with the other guys. They're, they're, they don't completely trust him. So putting him far afield seems safe, little did they know. <laughs> uh, and from his point of view, well, yeah, let me go conquer some nations and um, I'll, I'll, I'll get a name and a, re and a reputation and money and power and loyal followers. So they assign him to Gaul. Gaul is what we call France. Um, and there are Celtic peoples there. Gallic peoples, some on this side of the Alps, some on the other side, Cisalpine, Transalpine. And uh, so Caesar arranges for an army and goes off and starts conquering. Now, 
There was a time when probably anybody who was educated in the West could tell you the history of the Gallic Wars. I'm not. <laughs> I don't care and I don't know the details, uh, which betrays my horrible ignorance compared to other generations. There was a time at least when all high school students in America who were expected to excel at all got to reading Caesar. You may remember, mm -hmm. have either, did you ever, either of you ever act in our town? No. No. Okay. Well, Thornton Wilder has the girl, Emily, coming home from high school complaining about having to read Caesar. But that's, uh, that Caesar is awful hard. I don't know why we, have, why we have to learn a thing like that. That was the ultimate test of your education. Had you, could you actually read Caesar in the original Latin? But every student who at least tried knew the first line. All and Gaul I'm, is divided into three <laughs> parts. <laughs> and try, and try partes trace. There we go. Yeah, they knew that. Didn't know anything else, and neither did I. Don't care. Historically, <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure it's significant. <laughs> but the thing that matters, and if you're French, it matters a lot. I should think. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> but for 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 us, maybe not so much. Except for this. Uh, the history, the commentaries in the Gallic Wars, the history of the Gallic Wars, were a collection or a collected batch of the letters that Julius Caesar wrote back to Rome as he pursued his conquering. Why do we care that all Gaul is divided into three parts? Because he's going to go to each part and turn and conquer it. So he's telling his audience, basically he's being a foreign war correspondent, as well as the general who carries on the battles. He wants to make sure he gets good press, that he's the hero of every story, and that no one suspects him of, of cowardice or failure and incompetence. So he's sending these letters home and stirring the hearts and imaginations of the Roman people. He's making himself a hero while he continues to conquer. His main failure is he tried to conquer Britain twice. And by the <laughs> way, Britain, not England. There is no England. That comes later. <laughs> um, oh, odd thing. Britain supposedly is named after one of the surviving generals of the Trojan War, a man named Brutus. And we're going to run into a Brutus or two in this story. Um, in Latin, it just means brute, an animal. Um, there's Who also a Brutus. <laughs> yeah. Also in the uh, the Rape of Lucretius by, uh, Lucretia by uh, Shakespeare, he's telling how the, I think it was the Etrus Etruscan or the Tartan King, I, the, the, the kings who were not supposed to got kicked out of Rome. And one of the heroes there is a man named Brutus, which is a nickname because he's in on the conspiracy and he knows these guys have got to go. He all, he all, everyone knows he's a powerful warrior, so he has to play stupid. <laughs> and he spins a whole, and so they call him Brutus, stupid animal beast. And he has to play along with that. So the, the, this whole thing is littered. History is littered with Brutus. It's funny that no one names their child that anymore. I think it has more to do with Popeye. Um, do you remember Popeye the Sailor Man? Do you watch I the cartoon? I do. I don't remember a Brutus in it, though. Oh, Is well, he the, the rival? Yeah. In the earlier version, huh. he was called Bluto. Does that Bluto. help? That sounds big. More big familiar. guy, big muscles, yeah. beard, yes. mustache. Um, and yeah, the, the perpetual the perpetual rival. I, I remember as a small child, um, a particular episode of Popeye. Uh, Popeye, for some reason, is sent back to school to get his diploma. And he keeps failing every grade and they keep sending him back until he gets all the way to kindergarten or first grade. And the teacher asks him, Mr. Popeye, I have a very simple question for you. Where was Caesar when Brutus killed him? Uh, uh, and then somebody hands Popeye his spinach and he's able to, <laughs> da, 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 and, and yeah, that was, but what confused me as a child a little bit was Brutus, but Brutus is that character who's not in this one. What, what's he got to <laughs> do with anything? Anyway, so that's going on and Pompey, um, is getting nervous. Crassus goes over against the Parthians, thinks he's all that in a bag of chips, um, tells them, look, I got this, this great army and these great plans. You have no chance against me. Um, you just want to surrender. Why don't you come and talk to us and we will settle this peacefully? That Wouldn't that be peachy keen? 
yes, I will come and all will be well and the world will tremble at my grace. Well, he comes and they kill him and cut off his head and throw it back at the world. It does not go well. He, he dies. He's out of the picture. So much for him. So much for the triumvirate. Um, Pompey now is getting nervous of Caesar because unlike Crassus, uh, Caesar is being really successful. And Pompey goes to the... Um, did I ever get the, the Britain thing? I got distracted by the Britain thing. Caesar uh, we tried kind to take, of drove by it. Yeah, yeah. He, he tried to take Britain twice. It didn't work. Britain's going to have to wait for another day to be conquered. Anyway, so Siri, uh, Caesar, having failed that, um, de decides that maybe, um, maybe going back to Rome isn't such a bad deal. Meanwhile, Pompey is saying... Um, I don't trust this guy. And he goes before the Senate. And Caesar is a danger to the Republic. <laughs> uh, we need to brand him a public enemy. Uh, tell him uh, he needs to yield up his command. Um, Caesar hears this and says, I, 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 let's, let's compromise. That's a bit extreme. I'm not a bad guy. I mean, well, the Senate refuses any compromise and they make Pompey the effective dictator of Rome. It sounds like a Greek story. Uh, and commission him to destroy Caesar, however. And so word goes to Caesar, come back, but leave your army behind. In other words, walk into the trap, surrender yourselves, and once we've killed you, we'll talk about whether or not other deals are possible. <laughs> uh, Caesar comes as far as the River Rubicon on his way south, the border mm -hmm. between Cisalpine Gaul and Italy. And he spends a night walking back and forth and thinking really hard. This is the point where Christians would be praying. Uh, and do I go on without my army or, and try to make peace, try to sweet talk myself out of this? Or do I take my army, cross the river, and de they declare me a traitor and civil war starts and then I have to win it? Um, he decides to go on. Uh, he crosses the Rubicon from whence, in uh, colloquial English, the phrase to cross the Rubicon means to make an irrevocable decision. And he says uh, those Im immortal words, the die is cast. You know, <laughs> Which it's funny. Of course, we named our media group. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is, the die is cast can mean two different things at least. <laughs> And I think, I, I remember trying to look this up once, just, to, you know, are you casting a die to print things or are you throwing a random number generator on the ground to see if it's one, two, three, four, five, or six? I think it's the latter from what I can tell. In English, it's just very, very vague. Anyway, again, it's a thing that's passed as an idiom into, into English to make a final irrevocable decision. So he crosses the Rubicon, heads for Rome, Pompey flees, goes to find his armies, collect them. Caesar goes to Rome unopposed, assumes control of the city, and then stabilizes his control there, has control of Sicily, Spain, uh, meets with uh, Pompey's armies in Thessaly. Pompey flees. The empire's large now. Um, Egypt is sort of with is, is at its feet not quite under its control yet so egypt is a good place to go pompey flees to egypt the pharaoh on the throne once again is a very young man and he has a very pretty sister or at least a very sexually interesting one there are debates as to how pretty she actually is. <laughs> um her name is cleopatra and um despite what everyone thinks she's not egyptian she and her brothers are rulers of Egypt, but they are descendants of the of Alexander's general Ptolemy, and so they are Macedonian Greek by descent. And they would their first language would be Greek, and the literature they read would be Greek, and all that. Um, and they would look like Greeks, so <laughs> that matters to anybody about anything. Um, Pompey tries to hook up with the boy king. And apparently he and, um, and, and Cleopatra don't get along very well. But before anything really can happen, um, as Ptolemy comes ashore trying to get help from the king, someone kills him. He dies. And then Caesar shows up. And, oh, wow, there's Pompey. I was going to come and kill him. And, well, okay. <laughs> He's, all right. Well, oh, hi. Who are you? Wow, you're beautiful and useful. So um, let's go talk in the corner. So Caesar meets Cleopatra. 
They like each other. It turns into an affair that sets the ancient world on fire. Um, but her her younger brother doesn't like this, and his um, advisors tell him, you know, she's always been against you. Get rid of her. So he drives her from the throne. Caesar joins with her. There's civil war, and Caesar defeats the armies of her older brother, and Cleopatra is now queen of Egypt and a client of Rome, and so Rome sort of controls Egypt. It's not as complete as some other arrangements, but Cleopatra is the reigning queen, and she's literally in bed with Caesar, so close enough is close enough, right? Um, a year later, a child is born to Cleopatra, whom she calls Caesarion, because... She wants it to be very clear that this is Caesar's <laughs> <Yeah>. son. <laughs> exactly, because she knows that that's where the future goes. Now, speaking of the future, this this, this is a huge thing. Uh, and a number of biblical passages play into this. To this point, Egypt has been, in some measure, a major power in the Mediterranean world and in the Middle East. From the time of Moses on, even after it got smushed, it made a real comeback. And the question now is, here's this new upstart empire called Rome, but Egypt is so much more ancient, hoary with tradition. Uh, the gods have smiled on it for centuries. Wouldn't it be natural if we fuse these two powers for Egypt to eventually be the lead? If this boy child grows up as the son of a Roman general and the Egyptian queen... Won't this carry the course of empire back to Egypt, and Egypt will again be the center of everything? Now, as a secular historian, you can just say, well, that's interesting. It, it doesn't matter one way or other to us, except we know what happened. But from a biblical point of view, there's a couple things going on here. Ezekiel had prophesied that once Egypt got smushed in the days of Assyrian Babylon, it was never making a comeback. Uh, furthermore, there is a pattern that the, the, the later Enlightenment philosophers perceived of God pushing the course of empire westward. Uh, we go from uh, Babylon to Medo-Persia to Greece to Rome. And if we ever get that far in our study of history, we'll talk about what people did with that and what they thought might come next. Uh, but the, to a point, that, that, is a, that is something going on. And the prophecies of Daniel point not, as they point to the, the fourth nation, the fourth empire that will prove the guardian and the enemy of God's people, it's clearly not Egypt. It's something else. It's a wild beast with uh, iron teeth and iron claws that stamps and, and, and crushes and destroys. That's not Egypt. Um, and, and so we're, we're standing on what's going to be a key moment. Will Egypt rise up and be the power again, right at the footstep of God's people? Will it again become the dragon, the oppressor, the danger? Or is it going to vanish, politically speaking, into the Ashkan of history? Uh, it, 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 it's a crucial moment. And Rome? Rome? What's where? What? Hmm. Anyway. So Caesar, Caesar is... Sleeping with Cleopatra, they have a son. He actually brings Cleopatra back to Rome and shows her off. The Roman people are not impressed. She's, you know, one of those people. Another, a, a girl from another nation, another culture. The East, we don't trust the East anyway. All that Oriental mystery and treachery <laughs> and backstabbing. They didn't like her. And, and so in due time, she flees back to Egypt as it being a much safer place while Julius Caesar takes control of Rome and does not establish an empire. In fact, he so does not establish an empire that some people are kind of annoyed because they want a reason to kill him. <laughs> uh, and they, in fact, they make up stuff. He, the, the truth is that he is able to accumulate enough power to accomplish pretty much everything he wants to without having to lay claim to being a king or having a kingdom, let alone an emperor and an empire. Uh, and so when the conspirators, and Rachel's going to talk about this in just a minute, when the conspirators try to eliminate him, their claim is he was ambitious and wanted to be a king. And Mark Anthony's comeback is going to be, <laughs> no. <laughs> 
Now, we can read between the lines, at least as Shakespeare wrote them, and say, okay, the point, what you're really saying is he had everything he needed and didn't want the title, so, but was he ambitious? You don't know. And Brutus is an honorable man. <laughs> and Brutus, of all you know, he's an honorable man. Caesar had time to make some reform. Some of them weren't so bad. Some of them were just a return to socialism. He enlarged the Senate to 900 uh, and included new members from Italy and the provinces. In other words, he watered it down in his favor. But, <laughs> the you know, it, it was an empire. It was becoming an empire. It doesn't hurt to have people who are being ruled by you actually yield to some of your opinions. He distributed land to his veterans and the poor, founded 40 new colonies, including Carthage. <laughs> Remember when we sowed that with salt and played a curse on it? It's never going to be rebuilt. No, we didn't. Never mind. Never mind. He did establish Corinth. Yes, that Corinth, the one to which Corinthians was written. So that's important from a biblical point of view, because that's going to Paul, give Paul a chance to write lots of cool things to in two letters <laughs> to a city. Well, we're, we wouldn't have a discussion of speaking in tongues, the resurrection, or men who live in incest with their stepmothers if we didn't have <laughs> Corinth, Corinthians and Corinth. He extended citizenship liberally to physicians and teachers, many of whom had been slaves. Uh, and, and the logic here makes it sensible. He is looking at, all right, who's actually valuable? Whose vote should count? Who do we want to exalt and move on? I don't care about where they came from or about their past. What can they do for us? What can they do for me now? So if there are those kind of people, let's make them citizens and get them involved in the process. And if we're the ones who make them citizens, then they're going to kind of be loyal to us. So particularly uh, ex-slaves who might have been physicians or teachers or otherwise educated lawyers, there, and there were such, they got, they got the first uh, bite at, at being citizens. Um, he cut by half the number of people eligible for um, free grain, welfare, uh, bankruptcy laws that set the pattern for ours, a gold-based currency. I've always meant to check that out and find out what happened there, but it's a good idea in principle, to be sure. He tried to encourage Romans to begin having large families again, three children or more, because that was large in those days. Remember that... In the latter days of the Republic, marriage was falling apart and children were not being born. So he, we need more Romans. <laughs> he ordered the Roman calendar revised on Egyptian models. The Egyptians had a fair understanding of astronomy, a good deal of which they inherited from Babylon. And the Romans had picked up on that and Caesar had seen it in action. And during his time in Egypt said, yeah. So, so you're saying 365 and a quarter days. And tell me again about this leap year thing. So the fundamental calendar that most people are aware of, or to the degree that they are aware of our fundamental calendar, that's the Julian calendar. The problem will come later in the, in the Middle Ages when we find out it's not exactly 365 and a quarter. That's off a little. And it will be left to Pope Gregory to come up with a final fix so that we now observe a Gregorian calendar, which gets altered slightly what is it every time that there's double digits, double zeros in the yeah. day? Some, the yeah. the hundred uh, yeah. year doesn't get a leap year. Right. Which I don't remember in the year 2000. Maybe I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember the deals. The, the, the details were, 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 were very precise. And Europe slowly adopted this, uh, that is nation by nation, over a period of a very long time. And so if you are a historian um, studying in the, what is it, 14, 15, 1600s, even in the 1700s, you, you may need to remember that something that you're told by French sources happened on one day, you may be told by English sources happened on another day. They're not wrong. They're just using different calendars. Yeah. When the British Empire finally caved in and, and went along with this, People in the colonies went to went to sleep on one day and woke up the next day. What was it? Seven days later, something yeah, like that. Yeah, there were some days that didn't <laughs> exist in America. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so that was that was a it's better than 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 giving us a daylight savings time. You know. Yeah. 
Caesar, Caesar's uh, a little. Don't get me started. <laughs> oh, um, I was about to say he, well, he's better than FDR. Speaking of um, home, <laughs> work for the unemployed, <laughs> spending huge amounts erecting magnificent public buildings, including a, na- a new forum marketplace that he named for himself. And to deal with the ever-present problem of debt, he canceled all interest that had accumulated since the beginning of the revolution, which he kind of started. <laughs> and then he made one of the biggest mistakes of his career. It sounds good. And it's the kind of thing that you'd put in a modern movie for the good guys to do. He forgave all of his enemies, the ones that were still alive, the ones that were dead were the crucial ones. So he just forgave <laughs> everyone else, the Roman virtue of clementia, of, of forgiveness, but without repentance. He did not force them to have a change of heart because, well, you can't. You can't. <laughs> um, but he thought it was good publicity, good propaganda to formally forgive them all because he felt safe enough that he didn't think this would ever come back and bite him. He was wrong. And so on March 15th, the Ides of March, and then Rachel's going to take over here. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't realize you were going to stop in the middle of the sentence. Yes. So the famous Beware the Ides of March, which is March 15th, uh, comes from the assassination of Julius Caesar. So most of us know things like Brutus and Cassius or Et tu Brute, uh, but that's about all we know about his death. Uh, So I did a little more digging and discovered he, the main um, motivation for the conspiracy is that he offended people. (laughs) Basically, as I was looking around, I found an article through the University of Chicago that said he offended the senators because they came and brought him these honors of being the father of the country and dictator for life and consul for 10 years. How you can be dictator for life and consul for 10 years, I don't know. Uh, But they they made all of these wonderful overtures to him of what they were saying he was. And he was very like, okay, (laughs) I didn't really ask for that, but thanks. And they were offended that he was not more appreciative and exuberant over their honors. Uh, And then there Mm. was a debacle of him uh, dismissing some of the tribunes. Uh, who mm. represented some of the lower class and they thought that was a violation of the Republic. And so they determined that mm-hmm. was sufficient grounds. Also, he was about to head out to um, avenge Crassus's death among the, Par- the Parthians. And they were concerned that that would truly establish him as the great power of all powers. So they had to act mm. quickly and um, take him out. And they managed to get uh, Brutus that we know on their side because he was known as an honest man. And if he were to be involved, then it must be a just cause. Uh, and so they wait for him uh, at the, what is the place? At the uh, Curia Pompeii uh, for, mm-hmm. for a gathering that the senators have asked for. And pretty much he comes in, sits down and is, I wouldn't say mobbed, but... <laughs> approached by a large group who makes it look like, oh, we have a petition that we need to talk to you about. So we're going to totally surround you with this group of somewhere between 40 to 60 people. And then they all just start stabbing him. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the first guy goes for his neck and mostly misses. And so he gets a slight injury. But the second guy is probably the one that actually gave him the main blow uh, that killed him, but he ends up being stabbed 23 times by all this. And the group actually ends up stabbing each other also (laughs) because they're in such a mayhem that they're pretty much all covered in blood by the time that they're done. Uh, And he's just left laying there, but he does receive, um, the regular people don't rise up and support the conspirators as they expected that they would. Instead, they kind of turn on all the conspirators and actually side with Caesar, who is now dead. Uh, and so then his nephew is able to take over take over ruling and go after all the conspirators. And pretty much all of them end up being executed, plus many others. I think their count is that he ends up killing somewhere in 2000 range of people over this conspiracy uh, and actually goes out 
broad and wide to try to find all the people that might have been involved in some way. To, okay. <laughs> to revenge Julius Caesar. <laughs> um, yeah. The, trivia, there was another Brutus in the group besides Brutus. I think he was some heir or adopted something to Caesar, but no one cares about him because he was little Brutus and <laughs> lost in the cracks of history. Um, Mark Antony, who had been Caesar's best friend, right-hand man and such, is not there at the time. At least this is Shakespeare's version. <laughs> and, and, and rushes back, as does Caesar's nephew, Octavian, his adopted son. Octavian, you know, the, the Romans named their kids after numbers. In theory, when they got older, you gave them a real name. With child mortality so high, you know, sometimes it was easier to just call them Primus, Secundus, Tertius. And we ran into people in, in Paul's epistles. There's a Tertius, for instance, or Quintus, or Quartus. Octavian, he, he must have, this is a rare family. He must have had <laughs> seven siblings. Uh, we will know him. We know the history of the world remembers him not as Octavius, but or Octavian, but as Augustus. But he hasn't got that name yet. So he's there, and he and Anthony don't love each other. But right now they figure we were both loyal to Caesar, and um, these guys who killed him, they got to go. This is where we insert the marvelous speech from Caesar's play, Julius Caesar. Shakespeare's play. A Shakespeare's, and I, I was, I had it and thought maybe we could read this, but we don't have enough time. Yeah, but you all, <laughs> you all know. You can always post a link or something. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, we could post a link to um, Chuck Heston, Charlton Heston, uh, his version of the play, mm -hmm. which would be really good. Mm -hmm. But everyone knows the beginning of the speech. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The good that the evil that men do live after them, good is often interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. And he goes on, and as Rachel was suggesting earlier, praises Brutus with damning faint praise. And <laughs> Brutus says he was ambitious and low. Brutus is an honorable man. And as Shakespeare <laughs> paints it step by step, Mark Anthony, who's given permission to speak to defend the conspirators, ends up shredding them by telling Between the people. Between the lines. Yeah. It's stellar. <laughs> it, is, it is incredible. It's wonderful. <laughs> telling them what, what Caesar actually had done for them and what he's left to them and how these honorable men have taken it all away from them and him. And, and in the end, he stirs up the crowd to mutiny um, and he goes his way. But when it, what, whatever the real historical details were, in the end, Octavian and Mark Anthony managed to expel the conspirators or kill them by the hundreds, apparently. Um, and then they have to decide what they're going to do. Uh, they take on um, Brutus and Cassius and their armies, uh, both of whom commit suicide when they know they're going to lose. And having done that, with all opposition down, Anthony and Octavian kind of look each other in the eye and say, Something to the effect of, well, I don't trust you, I don't trust you. But it would be bad for Rome for us to, you know, start another war. It would. <laughs> so you go to the right hand and I'll go to the left hand. Sounds like a lot in Abraham. And um, you roll over there and I'll roll over here. We'll and deal I'm with this later. <laughs> <laughs> we'll deal with this later. So Antony gets the east and he goes, ends up in Egypt and meets Cleopatra, who, of course, is still doing her bit of social climbing. And so she sets her sights on him and they have their little affair and Octavian and the Roman nobility are unimpressed. And so we begin to get this, this conflict between the two halves. Propaganda war ensues, ensues. There we go. There was a third man in this. His name is Lepidus. Nobody knows about him. Yeah. He, they get, he gets shunted <laughs> aside and becomes the high priest and no one cares. Uh, I remember, again, when I was in some elementary grade and I and it was a sort of, you know, round robin, who knows these obscure things. And uh, the question was, who's who's the third man in the tribe? Well, I got, okay, Mark Anthony and uh, Augustus and the teacher looks at me, I'm, uh, uh, Octavian, okay. And, and 
I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> His name is Lepidus and he is completely forgettable. <laughs> <laughs> so the kingdom, the well, the not the non-kingdom kingdom, the non-empire empire, empire uh, is now divided east and west. Sound familiar? With uh, Octavian on one side, commanding from Rome, and Antony and Cleopatra on the other, commanding from Egypt. And eventually, they just say such nasty things about each other in the public press, or the equivalent of that day, that they can't stand each other anymore, and they go to war. Their armies, or actually navies, meet off the coast of a Greek town called Actium. Uh, and this is one of those decisive battles in Earth's history. It wasn't much of a battle. Antony and Cleopatra come in commanding their separate fleets, Egyptian and Roman, and Octavian, mostly with ground troops, but he has some ships, and they, they go out to meet them. And Cleopatra panics. And uh, Antony turns around and sees her rowing off in the opposite <laughs> direction, fleeing the battle. Well, he goes, my dear, come out, wait for me, I come with you. So they sail off, they, they abandon the battle, and they sail off toward Egypt. Octavian does not follow by sea. He has armies, and he takes them a long way around, a very long way around, up Greece, Macedonia, across the, the Dardanelles, the Bosphorus, down through Asia Minor, down through Palestine, where he meets an interesting historical character who we'll talk more about another time. This man's name is Herod. <laughs> um, Herod had been a supporter of Antony and Cleopatra. He had he provided um, supplies and, and arms and such. But when, uh, when Octavian comes his way, he goes out to meet him boldly, humbly, and does the Hi, boss. Um, here I am. Uh, sorry about the misunderstanding. You lose my head next. I'm. I am so for you. I'm on your side. What do you want? What do you want? I can get it for you. I got it for you. I'm your guy. I'm your man. Live or die. Good to see you. Welcome here. And Octavian, oddly enough, says, "Oh, okay, cool." So, um, <laughs> and um, they they cut some deals and some ideas. And oddly enough, Octavian is so impressed that he actually promotes Herod, who had been opposing him, uh, suggests sending some troops into some of the nearby little kingdoms. That hey, they're handy. I got an army. Um, little kingdoms that uh, had bothered the Jews no end for a very long time. Let me see if I can read my notes here. Actually, I'm reading the text of Scripture. The Edomites, the Moabites, the children of Ammon. So they try to invade that. It doesn't go so well, and Octavian's got better things to do. So he pursues after Antony and Cleopatra, goes on into Egypt, and lo, they are dead, having committed suicide, which seems to be a very common theme in this whole story. And so with the king or the, the queen of Egypt dead, her consort dead, and Egypt wide open to attack and invasion, Egypt just puts up its hands and says, okay, we're yours. What do you want? And Anthony or Octavian now has the best part of what will be the Roman Empire. He goes home, um, takes the title Augustus, which means godlike. <laughs> refuses the title of king or emperor, takes the title of first citizen, and declares an era of peace, the Pax Romana. The temple of Janus in Rome is closed. The symbol of that war is now over, and, the, and war will be over for about 80 years, until around 80, 70, oddly enough, when it, <laughs> they almost lose everything. But that's another story. And so this, we're up to AD 29. We still have a little bit to go before Jesus is born. We are solidly, well, Actium technically marks the end of the Hellenistic age, but the general influences and such continue. The, the ages overlap. But Rome is now in control. Uh, Greek will continue as the language of literature. Greek ideas will continue as the philosophical background. But Roman law, Roman power, Roman armies are going to force everyone to play nice and not run with scissors uh, and the world finally is going to know peace and Virgil's dream of a world a world of peace, a new world order uh, brought about by Rome. It's going to be fulfilled. Sure it is. <laughs> and um, that's... And there a, we messed up. <laughs> and there's, there we stop as we come very near the birth of the Messiah. 
All right. Well, shall we close out with some recommendations? Yeah, I recommend watching William Shakespeare's play Julius Caesar. If only, if <laughs> I only. I did that last time, though. <laughs> I'm, doing, I'm doing it again. <laughs> okay. Because I'm going to be specific. Uh, particularly watch the uh, speech of Mark Anthony as he turns on the conspirators ever so subtly, a little bit at a time. You can hardly miss it. He's Because he they, they are such honorable men. He tells us so over and over again. <laughs> so whether or not it's actually it's actual history, at least it gives you a feel for how sleazy politicians can be <laughs> and how sometimes there are no good guys. So And it is the story that we've told ourselves collectively over the past yeah. <laughs> 400 years. So it does matter. <laughs> yes, indeed. Emily? Uh, my recommendation is going to be a series of comic books oh. um, called Asterix and Oblix. Oh, yes. Um, they're closely associated with Tintin in my mind. Um, but when you go back and read Tintin, it's like, oh, okay. This was better when I was a kid. Um, <laughs> Asterix and Oblix is uh, ages like fine wine. Um, <laughs> it's, it's originally a uh, French. Tintin is Belgian, but I think uh, Asterix is French. Um, but when they translate it, they have to count the puns <laughs> in each square to make sure that they're uh, coming up with equivalents in the target language. <laughs> um, there's one particular that I actually did not read at any point in my childhood, but we had like a VHS Yeah. Uh, cartoon movie adaptation of Asterix in Britain, uh, which was very fun. Um, the, the premise is that there's this one indomitable village in Gaul that has not fallen to Rome because they possess the secret of the magic potion that makes them invincible. Mm. Um, and so uh, a distant cousin of Asterix comes from Britain. His name is Anticlimax. <laughs> and he comes and enlists Asterix and Obelix's aid in uh, repelling the Roman troops. So if you want the non-historical version of why Britain did not fall to Rome, it's a great read. Okay. Rachel. All right. Mine again will be very different from the other two. <laughs> uh, so this time I am actually going to recommend uh, one of my husband's sermons. Oh, okay. uh, this, uh, this past Sunday, uh, which will not probably be the past Sunday when you hear this. Uh, so it you better give be, them a date so they can find it. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say, what was the day? Was it the, the this 8th? This past Sunday was the 8th, yes. Okay, yes. So um, September 8th, uh, he preached, uh, he's preaching through the book of Mark, and he preached through Mark, or he was preaching on Mark 12, 18 to 27, which is the Sadducees challenge on the whole idea of the resurrection of the dead mm -hmm. and marriage in it. And um, one, I thought he gave one of the better explanations I've heard of Jesus's response in terms mm -hmm. of you don't understand the power of God. You don't know the scriptures. Um, so I was, I was very encouraged and learned some new things. Uh, so I wanted to put that out there because I, I appreciated that, but also his uh, emphasis on the beauty and the wonder of the coming resurrection mm -hmm. and the new creation was extremely encouraging uh, and really where our focus should be in that in that passage um, was was wonderful. So you would find it at gracereformedwillows.org under sermons and you can hear hear him preach. Obviously all his sermons are there, but um, <laughs> But that was one that particularly stood out to me as uh, as exceptional. So there's my little Very plug cool. for that. Yay. Okay. Thanks. Excellent. All right. Thank you both so much for this conversation. As always, it has been a delight. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Uh, thanks to our transcriptionist who donates her time to make sure that this podcast is available to you in your inbox if you want it. Uh, if you would like that, you can subscribe to our Substack called Halting Towards Zion, just like the name of the podcast. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Um, and a big thank you to our financial supporters for keeping the show rolling. Uh, as I mentioned in passing, this is a production of Diecast Media Group. So cheers. Have a good night. Bye.